it's official. The LA Clippers will open up the first round of the playoffs against the Phoenix Suns. Probably the hardest possible route the Clippers could have gone is what they end up in. And what are the three keys going to be, or three of my biggest keys for the Clippers to pull off this upset? Going to be talking about it all on today's Locked On Playoff Clippers. You are Locked On Clippers, your daily Los Angeles Clippers podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Yes, sir. You are locking in with the Clips. Thank you for making Locked On Clippers the first listen of your day, your team, every day. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. My name is Darren Vaziri. I'm your host. I've been a Clipper fan for 18 years. And you can also follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dripper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more Clipper and NBA content. Just released a video on why the Dallas Mavericks did not make the playoffs play in with two Mavs fans. Locked on Clippers is free and available on all your favorite podcasting platforms, including YouTube, where I want you to comment your prediction for the series now that it's official. And I better be seeing a lot of Clippers going to win the series, even though that's not the popular pick, probably not the realistic pick with Paul George out of the series. But let me know we are locked on Clippers. So this is Clipper Nation. And I know Clipper Nation is full of optimists. Now, that sounds kind of ironic coming from somebody who's been fairly pessimistic all year. However, I have a feeling, as I've said in the last couple episodes, that we're really going to do this thing. We're really going to do this thing, and it's going to have to be a team effort. And that means one to one million, not one to 15. The million, And yes, there are millions of Clipper fans. Yes, there are. And they're going to come out in groves. They need to. And we need to go nuts for this team but in this episode i'm going to be talking about the three i don't want to say the three keys because i think there are many keys for the clippers to win this series but three of the biggest keys in my opinion and let's start with the first one playoff Kawhi. all season long we've heard about let's just get the team to the playoffs healthy it doesn't matter about this regular season game here and there as long as we get our guys healthy going to the playoffs we failed We failed at that and still got a terrible route. So what does that say about the medical staff, the players, the coaching staff? I don't think it was just the inavailability or, you know, unavailability of the players and load management that prevented us from getting a better record. I think obviously the poor season that Ty Lewis had and obviously, you know, Reggie Jackson and Marcus Morris falling off a cliff. That wasn't, I don't really put that on the front office. It happened. You saw it. The problem was how long it took to go away from it. And that cost the Clippers games. That cost the Clippers games. But I'm not trying to put everything on one person here. Fact of the matter is the Clippers had a very poor regular season for the standard and expectation that was set for them coming in. And I have to say, playoff Kawhi is the only thing that we have to look forward to in this sense. We may have not gotten Paul George healthy to the playoffs, but we did get Kawhi Leonard who we didn't have in the conference finals against the Suns last time, who we haven't seen since 2021, where he was putting up amazing numbers. And for those that don't know, 30 points per game, 8 rebounds, 4.5 assists pretty much, 4.4. 57% from the field, 39% from 3, and 88 from the line. I repeat, 30 set up 30 points, eight rebounds, four assists on 57, 39, 88 splits. He was arguably the best player in the world the last time we saw him in the playoffs. He is playing great basketball this season as well. He probably won't make an all NBA team, even though he should probably be in consideration. He's missed 30 games. So next year, technically he'd be ineligible. But he's been playing amazing basketball. And all season long, we've kind of been banking on this. As long as Kawhi is healthy in the playoffs, we got a shot against anybody. Well, in my opinion, he has to be the best player in this series. I don't see a scenario where he and KD just cancel each other out and the Clippers still win. It would take the role players to go absolutely berserk. Or their stars, Devin Booker, Aiton, Chris Paul, 
two of them, if not three of them besides KD, to just have completely underwhelming series, in my opinion, for the Clippers to win if Kawhi is not the best player. If Kawhi outplays everybody in the series, and that doesn't mean score the most points. That just means be dominant, attract two defenders, be a problem, be something that the Suns can't deal with, and obviously the best version that he can be defensively given his offensive load. So when I say that, I mean, you know, 2021 level, and hopefully in the last couple of games, 2021 level in games six and seven, where he guarded Luka a lot more. Look, I don't expect him to guard Kevin Durant as the primary guy to start the game. But he's got to have to guard him a lot. And he's going to have to guard Devin Booker as well. It's going to take one of the most Herculean efforts, in my opinion, of Kawhi Leonard's career to do this. If you want to talk about Kawhi Leonard carrying, I think at times in that first round series against the Mavericks in the bubble when Paul George was just going through it mentally, I think you could say he was carrying there. But the bubble, I just, it was just not very, it's not playoff basketball to me. Eight, minute, eight games before the regular season out of nowhere after months hiatus. Doesn't excuse the Clippers for not winning and underperforming. It doesn't. But it's just hard to compare anything to that. However, I think a better, more accurate carry job, quote-unquote, is when Kawhi played against the Sixers in 2019. If you actually look at the stats for that series, and you know what? I have Kawhi Leonard's stats up right now, so let me look at them myself. He really kind of carried, if you want to say that, offensively in that series for Toronto. He averaged... 35 points a game. Nobody else in this, on the Raptors averaged 20. Pascal Siakam, 19. Kyle Lowry, 13. And no one else besides those three were in double-figure points. Kawhi Leonard averaged 16 more points than the second highest scorer on the team. That is a carry job offensively. And so we've seen him do that. But I'm not going to discredit Pascal Siakam, Kyle Lowry, Marcus Gasol. Like, those guys are all better defensively than what the Clippers have right now. The Clippers end the season middle of the pack in the categories that matter 16th in offensive rating and 18th in defensive rating so they're bang average both ways however there's been so many different kind of iterations of this clipper team within this season you have the reggie and senior playing too much you have the reggie's been taken out of the starting lineup pre-deadline terrence mann starting lineup and then you have the russell westbrook era of the season so I don't have all those numbers up. Maybe in the next couple of episodes, I'll go do that digging. But right now, just looking at it, you know, surface level, the Clippers have been an average team this season. Good if you want to compare them to the rest of the league. Poor if you want to compare them to their standard. But overall, I'd say they're, they're, they've been solid. They're great some nights and they're horrendous some nights. And I think that being 16th in offensive rating and then 18th in defensive rating sums up this Clipper team this season. For the Phoenix Suns, it's really hard as well to compare with them because they have a Kevin Durant team without Mikael Bridges, without Cam Johnson now. But they were 7th in defensive rating this season and 14th in offensive rating. But again, those numbers just don't really mean much with Kevin Durant coming in for two players that were marquee wings for their team and Cam Johnson and Mikael Bridges. But moral of the story, I think Kawhi Leonard needs to be the best player in this series. As for his matchup with Kevin Durant, I think as a neutral, this is just amazing. You get two of the best small forwards, two, not just two of the best small forwards, two of the best players of this generation, of the last 12 years, in my opinion. You know what? In Kevin Durant's case, that's true. But in Kawhi's case, I'd say two of the best players of the last 10 years. I think that's more fair. As of the 2013-14 Finals MVP that Kawhi got, I think his ascendance, ascendancy, his rise started right around there. But Kevin Durant and Kawhi Leonard are no strangers to each other in the playoffs. It's just been a while. And I'm not counting... 2019 where KD played like a quarter and a half and then got hurt. I'm not counting 2017 where Kawhi didn't even play a game and Zaza stepped, you know, underneath him. It actually started with, and by the way, so long story short, when Kawhi Leonard's kind of been on KD's level as a basketball player, which I think he has been for the last seven years, they have never really played each other in a full series fully healthy. Only before, where Kevin Durant was clearly the better player, did they play each other in the playoffs. Starting with Kawhi Leonard's rookie year, 2011-12. The Spurs were the higher seed. They were up 2-0 in the series. And then the Thunder won four straight games to go to the finals and eventually lose to the Heat. 2014 Conference Finals, Kawhi at that point was better and had a really solid series, really good series from my memory. 
KD was an MVP that year. Um, but see, Kawhi only averaged 12 points a game in the series. You know, it just wasn't the same same level of player. Whereas Kevin Durant averaged 26 points in that series. Russell Westbrook actually led that Thunder team in points in that series. But obviously, as you'd expect, the efficiency was better for KD. But yeah, 2014. And then the last time we saw them in the playoffs against one another in a real series that they completed was 2016. That was really fun. Really high quality series between the second seeded San Antonio Spurs, who finished 67 and 15 that year. Pretty sure that was their franchise record in wins in a season that they didn't even win the championship. They were 40 and I'm sorry, 39 and 2 at home, I think, that season. Just unbelievable. And the Thunder upset them in six games. And I had the Spurs winning that series, especially with <laughs> game one. They just absolutely waxed the Thunder in San Antonio. It was 124 to 92. But the Thunder won in six and then obviously blew that 3-1 lead to Golden State. KD goes to Golden State after that. The rest is history. But in that series, Kawhi Leonard was a star at this point. KD averaged 28 and a half points, seven rebounds, and four assists on 50% shooting. But he only shot 30% from three, which is not great for KD. And then Kawhi averaged 23 points, seven boards, and four assists on 48.6% from the field and 29% from three. So KD still kind of has the edge in the statistical category, and he did win the series. So, I mean, KD is not outplayed. Um, Kawhi has not outplayed KD in a series yet. This is different Kawhi Leonard, though, coming off being a finals MVP, being the clear-cut man for his championship team, which KD was not. He was not the clear-cut man. Steph Curry and KD fans will, and even Warriors fans, will have the argument of who is the better player on those teams till the cows come home. But in my opinion, the moral of the story is Kawhi Leonard needs to be the best player in this series for the Clippers to win. We've got him fully healthy. He's been playing great basketball. He finished the season averaging 24 points a game even though he started out super slow for his standards, he finished shooting 50, 40, 87. 51, 41 and a half, and 87 to be exact. So damn near 50, 40, 90. 3% free throw away from it being 50, 40, 90, coming off an ACL tear. I mean, the guy has just been unreal, and he's still been a good defender as well. So we need him to be the best player in the series. That's my take. Coming up, though, I got to tell you, about the second option. Obviously, for the Suns, it's Devin Booker. You could even argue it's 1A, 1B with him and Kevin Durant sometimes. No Paul George. Who's going to be that second guy for the Clippers? Do they need a second guy? Going to be talking about that coming up. But before I do that, you know, with everything going on right now in LA, the Kings are in the playoffs, the Clippers are in the playoffs, the Lakers are in the playoffs. I'm just trying to figure out which playoff games I'm going to because I'm an LA sports fanatic. I just love consuming playoff sports. And, you know, buying tickets to your favorite games and events just shouldn't be this stressful. But game time is a fast and easy way to buy tickets for all sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. And I'm going to be checking it out uh, right after I get off this, honestly. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun you're going to have at those events. And forget about planning months in advance. Game time has deals right up to the day of the event. So if you want to go last minute, you don't know whether you can go or not. Game time still has you covered. Get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football and baseball, basketball, concerts, comedy, whatever it may be. The game time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, game time will credit a hundred credit you a hundred per hundred and ten percent of the difference. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use the code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNBA for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guarantee. All right. So the Clippers against the Suns, obviously Devin Booker and Kevin Durant being able to go off for 30 points every single game on any occasion is going to be tough to match because the Clippers have two guys like that, but one of them is out, probably for their whole whole series. Now, he did give an update, quote-unquote, on his podcast on Monday, but it wasn't anything crazy. It was really that Paul George, bless his soul, is working so hard to get back on the court, you know, hours and hours a day. And he's doing whatever he can. He's, you know, he's not on crutches anymore, which is great. 
But I saw him limping pretty heavily watching his, you know, kids. I think he was his kids, yeah? He has kids? Oh, my God. I'm blanking on that one. I'm pretty sure he has kids. He was walking around the backyard as they were picking up Easter eggs, and he was limping. He clearly is not in any position to be running. So let alone play playoff basketball against a team of that caliber. I don't think he's going to be back first round. Now, he could heal quicker than I expect, but I don't think he's going to be back first round. So just that being said, the Clippers are missing 24 points a game. And, you know, fun fact about now that the season stats are kind of over, and I kind of feel like wanting to do an individual kind of episode on the season for the individual players of the Clippers. And I got a couple episodes this week I can do, so no game till Sunday. But Kawhi Leonard and Paul George finished with the exact same PPG, 23.8. Pretty funny. Obviously, Kawhi Leonard more efficient from both the three and the field. And that's coming off an ACL where he started out super poorly. So that tells you how efficient he's been since he came back in December, really. But not to take anything away from Paul George, we're going to miss him massively. The Clippers don't have a clear-cut second guy without him. It can be anybody on a given night. But when I made an episode early in the season on who was the Clippers' third guy, it was every. I said it was Norman Powell, and it turned out being a pretty good take. Russell Westbrook, in my opinion, is the second best player on the Clippers without Paul George, but Norman Powell needs to be the second scoring option in this series, and I think he will. He needs to average 18 to 20 points for me. I don't think he's ever had this big a role on a team. The Blazers, he was still the third scorer behind McCollum and Dame. I think Russ, you know, he hasn't had a good playoff series since 2017. That's just really being honest. He hasn't. And some might argue that he was inefficient in that series and he was only, you know, his stats only look good because he had to do everything. But look, when the when he was on the floor in that 2017 series against Houston, they were competitive. And by the way, Eric Gordon, Lou Williams, Chris Paul. I'm sorry, not Chris Paul. Eric Gordon and Lou Williams are in that series on the Rocket side. But my point is, in that series, Russell Westbrook, when he was on the court, it was competitive. When he was off the court, they just got destroyed. And yeah, you can say that's because of the way the team was constructed. But the point is, it's been six years to me since Russ has had a good playoff series. We need him, in my opinion, to win the series, to have a good series. Doesn't need to be crazy. Doesn't need to average a triple-double. Doesn't even need to average 20 points. Needs to just make plays, create shots, play hard defense, make teams pay when they leave him open, whether that's on the glass or attacking space or knocking down an open jumper. And he's been shooting, I think, 36% from three as a clipper, Russell Westbrook has. So, I mean, 35.6%. Yeah, so he rounds up to 36. And shooting 49%, I might add. So Russ has been pretty efficient as a clipper. And obviously, you know, his playmaking is great. His defense, for the most part, has been decent. Some games really good, some games awful. That's why I say decent, because like overall it averages out. But against Kevin Durant and Chris Paul, I don't think you're going to need much motivating for Russ. And he's going to feed off a playoff Clipper crowd. Clipper crowd has really embraced Russ so far. Extra loud when he gets introduced. Really loud when he scores. I mean, he's got a lot of people there just for him too, like his family. You know, on a daily, on a game-to-game -game basis. That's awesome for him. And... You know, there's no coincidence. I keep talking with Laker fans on Twitter and like God bless and YouTube. You know, so many of my subscribers for Dime Dropper are Laker fans, and God bless them all. But you know, they say you can't blame the Lakers, LeBron, and all these things for Russ shooting shots off the backboard. Yes, you can, because mental mental game matters in sports. Confidence is everything. Russ was a player that was devoid of confidence, defeated, acting extremely out of character. That's because he was not wanted. And listen, again, I know I've been sounding like I have all these sources. I don't. I really don't. But I did hear from a really good friend that sat down with one of the trainers, player development guys for the Lakers, gave a little more context on last season. And let's put it this way. When stuff started going wrong for them, Russ was left in the cold. All the stuff you see is an act. You know, you think Russell Westbrook would just add, act that kind of weird and bitter out of nowhere and be so unwilling to change and all that if they, if he was treated properly? I think Darvin Ham tried to reel him in this year and he tried to be professional, but he's not stupid. He knew LeBron was trying to orchestrate a trade behind the scenes with Palinka to get Kyrie Irving. Like, if every one of us know that, you think Russell Westbrook doesn't know that they're trying to shop him? It's just... It wasn't the right fit. He's been totally different here, and absolutely the price tag and having that experience with the Lakers has humbled him. I agree. 
But point blank, the Clippers, from a fan standpoint, to the media, to the players, to the coaching staff, they have done a better job with Russ. He's much more willing to cut off the ball. He's more willing to set screens. He's more willing to sit at the end of games and watch and cheer his teammates on. That's not... No, and by the way, the reason why I brought up this, that backboard shot, that left wing shot off the glass that just got memed to death, minute-long compilations with Benny Hill music of him just straight hitting the backboard and it coming off, shacked in a fool style, he has not had one of those misses since being a Clipper. And that's not coincidental. Anybody that has played basketball at any level to me should understand this. Confidence is everything. He was thinking too much. Because he knows when he misses like that, memes, boos, it's just a lot of pressure. And maybe you can say in that sense he didn't handle the pressure brilliantly. But listen, man, it's Russell Westbrook. Like he's been under, he's been in the finals before. He's played under pressure. He's been a guy that's literally been the man of an entire state, the only professional team in the state. So miss me with that stuff. He's been here before. We're going to need a good series from him, in my opinion. But. Overall, the main takeaway is I think Norman Powell needs to be huge. I think he needs to continue to get to the basket. He needs to get to the foul line a lot because the one thing about him getting in the foul line besides the obvious, you know, free points is it stops momentum for the other team. It lets the Clippers set their defense and take a breath. And we don't have many guys that get to the line like that. The only thing is the Suns are going to have film on him. They have to funnel him to his left. They have to do everything they can. Because he's just a totally different player going to his left and going to his right. That curl play, I'm interested to see how they snuff it out. I think they'll probably switch it a lot and have Aiton just come up and bump, try to bump him off his spots. But you better be careful. That dribble handoff is quick. And when he catches the ball, if you let him turn the corner on you, he's to the rim. And he's finishing. I think Norm's going to have a good series. But what, we, what would be really nice about, about Norm is if his three ball starts falling again. Because he's that's the area he's been cold ending the season but I think it'll come back I really do but coming up the last and arguably to some the biggest thing the most important factor of this series for the Clippers I'm going to tell you what that is coming up but before I do that I got to tell you about prize picks the play-in games start on Tuesday and I couldn't be more excited Atlanta and Miami rematch of the one versus eight matchup in last year's first round and we have Lakers and Minnesota. So for all you local LA people listening, Lakers in action. It's going to be big in the city. I've got for this, and by the way, so for those that don't know where Prize Picks is, Prize Picks is the best daily fantasy app out there. All you got to do is pick two to six players and predict if they will score more or less than their Prize Picks projection. It's not betting, it's just fantasy entries. And of course, not competing against anyone else. It's just you versus the prize picks projections that are available. And it's not just basketball you can do this on. You can do it MLB, baseball season's back in full swing, NHL playoffs are coming up. Entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. Safe and fast withdrawals and currently operational in over 30 states and Canada. And on Tuesday, I'm going with the over on Jimmy Butler's points. It's at 27 and a half right now. And I think play in Jimmy Butler, you know, you got a must win kind of game at home. I think he's going to go for 30. And then dunks jimmy butler is at one dunk i'm taking the over he's gonna have two dunks if he's scoring 30 points yes it'll be, it'll be a lot of free throws but i think he's getting two dunks and bam out of bio has one and a half dunks i'm taking the over i think he'll get two whether it's on a putback or a lob or something the hawks defense just doesn't really move me just got to download the prize picks app or go to prizepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports first time users can receive a 100 percent instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars with the promo code locked on if you deposit a hundred dollars prize picks will give you a hundred dollars if you deposit fifty dollars prize picks will give you fifty dollars don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to a hundred dollars all right, to close out, maybe the most important factor in this series for the Clippers to win, more important than Kawhi being the best player in the series, more important than Norman Powell averaging 18 to 20 points, more important than Russell Westbrook having his first good series since 2017. And mind you, Russell Westbrook, it's totally different standards for him than with Washington, than with Houston, than with you know all those seasons he's playing at an all-star level. He's been very good for us in his role. In his role, though. Keyword role, meaning kind of more of a role player. Now, I want you... Honestly, another comment I want in the in the questions, or another comment I want in the comment section, is 
Do you think Russ needs to play at an all-star level for the Clippers to win the series? Or do you think he just he can just still be a good role player? If he's playing badly, you can just put somebody else in. It's no big deal. You don't need that from Russ. Let me know what you think. Along with your series pick, do we need Russ to be a star in this series to win? But maybe the most important thing, Ty Lu. He's been under so much scrutiny this year, a lot of criticism, and in my opinion, deserved. Some people have even gone as far as to say they got to fire him. Many people in the comment section. But you just were never even going to consider doing that when he hasn't had one bad playoffs yet. He hasn't been eliminated with a healthy team yet as Clipper coach. And look, he might not even get the opportunity to play with a healthy team in this playoffs, especially if we lose this series. But this is where playoff Ty Lue needs to come around. He's been heralded for his adjustments the way he maneuvered the 2021 playoffs and came back or led the Clippers from coming back from two oh two deficits to win series let's see what he does the main thing is he needs to lean defense first with the decisions and lineups so that means a good amount of Terrence Mann probably need to play Robert Covington especially against a team like the Phoenix Suns where Length can bother Chris Paul. You're going to need some against Kevin Durant, Devin Booker to just get a hand up on their mid-range shots and just not let them. The thing about Robert Covington, Nico Batum, their weakness is they're not great at staying in front anymore one-on-one. But Devin Booker and KD, despite the fact that they can still blow by you, they're not the quickest one-on-one. It's not like a John Morant or a De'Aaron Fox or a Donovan Mitchell, anything like that. So if they can just... Stay in front best they can. Try to be physical and keep them off their spots. Force them into some tough shots, which, look, they're tough shot makers. They're going to make them. They live off those. But just put a hand up and hope they can deter shots enough. Then the Clippers can be successful in this series. But you're going to need those guys to play. So three guard lineups, I mean, you really can't do much of them. The only exception, I'd say, is like Russ, Bones, and Norm. If the Suns go with like a Kogi, Booker, and Paul at once. Or like Payne. Shamit and Booker, something like that. You can match that. But Bones, Russ, and Norm, I don't like that. And Bones, Russ, and Eric, I don't know how much I like that either. Those combinations, I don't think we can do that. But other than that, the adjustments that Ty makes, is he fair with guys? You know, now now that we have Marcus Morris Sr. and Reggie Jackson out of the picture... That makes Ty Lue's job easier and the chances of him coaching poorly, in my opinion, quote unquote, because that's subjective as well. You know, you might not agree that he's coaching poorly, but for me playing the wrong guys, which he's done a lot this season with the leash that he's had with Marcus Morris and Reggie compared to everybody else. Now he doesn't have those two guys. He's got 10 players to choose from. Russell Westbrook, Eric Gordon, Kawhi Leonard, Nicholas Batum, Ivica Zubats, Norman Powell, Bones Highland, Terrence Mann, Robert Covington, and Mason Plumley. He can play all 10 of them. He can play nine of them, and one of them is out. But he's got a good group of 10 to work with here. He's got to lean into defense. And then after that, the adjustments, the schemes, the way he guards guys, that is going to be interesting to see that's all spontaneous that's all just making adjustments changing your scheme after you see something in game one and all that that's on the fly and in the next episode i think that's what i'm going to focus on actually like literal schemes how we're going to guard certain guys what i would do if i were the suns against us and then we're going to obviously try to collab with brendan clean from locked on suns to talk with him so it's just exciting times it's really exciting times to be a clipper fan even though you might not think so we're in the playoffs and there's other teams Less these days with the playing twist, but you know, there's teams that aren't in the playoffs, and we've very much throughout the course of NBA history not been in the playoffs. So, I just want to remind everybody to not take that part for granted. And please, please, Clipper fans, I'm begging you every episode, buy your tickets because Suns fans will come on the weekend for one of those games, especially buy your tickets because you know, also know with the affordability of them, and they're going to be expensive actually, but relative to other teams. Laker fans are going to try to infiltrate and just watch basketball. Don't let them. Get your tickets. We need everyone we can get. We need that place as loud as 2015 because I think that's part of the reason we beat that Spurs team. I said that last episode. The crowd was insane. I don't think we've matched that for a full series since, even the conference finals. We matched it in one game, and we know which game that was. 
can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dime Dropper Pod. Subscribe to my own YouTube channel, Dime Dropper, for even more Clipper content and NBA content. Going to be doing playoff previews all week. Locked on Clippers, free and available on all your favorite podcasting platforms, including YouTube. I want you to comment on today's pin question. Do you think Russ needs to be a star for the Clippers to win the series? And what's your series prediction? And of course, you got to subscribe to this channel and hit the notification bell so you know every time we post a video. Locked on, or thank you for making Locked on Clippers your first listen today. Now make your second listen, game to game, NBA, every moment, every top performance, every result. Locked on game to game covers every game from across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked on can deliver. Follow game to game on N- on Locked on NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. The age-old proverb continues. Go Clippers.